Okay, what do you think is going to be the hot topic of discussion on the repealing of the Townsend Act? What's going to be the key thing? Same thing happened in the Stamp Act. No, what's going to be the key thing to get these repealed? Non-importation acts are going to hit again. But we'll, we'll start with this. In 1770, Lord Frederick North became the new Prime Minister of Great Britain. Who did he replace? Anybody remember that? I'd be impressed. George Grenville. Very good. So in 1770, Lord Frederick North became Prime Minister of Great Britain, replacing George Grenville. Now think about this. When Lord North assumed control of Parliament, compare the gap between the American colonists and the British government from when Grenville took over to now when North takes over. What's that gap going to look like? So when Grenville started, here was the gap in philosophy and opinion between the American colonists and the British Parliament. <clears throat> when by the time Lord North took over, that gap got smaller, less controversy, or larger? More controversy. Larger. No question about it. So when Lord North assumed control of the Parliament, this gap between the American colonists and the British government was not only wide, but very wide. So he took over a tough situation. Now, he tried to make a few points with the colonists because as soon as he took over as Prime Minister, he urged Parliament to repeal the Townsend Acts. Urged him to repeal them. And the reason for doing that wasn't so much he wanted to make peace with the colonists, but he wanted the what to end? Non-importation agreements. Because once again, they were ruining the business of British merchants. So again, the colonists are very smart to pull out that chip when they have some problems. So they made some changes. This cost them too much to enforce the towns and acts, right? So they decided they would repeal them. The non-importation <laughs> agreements were once again ruining the businesses of the British merchants and it was causing more economic troubles in a country that was already heavily in debt. So they repealed them. They followed by repealing the Quartering Act as well. They repeated the Quartering Act as well. Well, do you think this helped colonial unrest for a period of time? It did. For a period of time, a little less than three years, actually things went decent in the colonies. Once they repealed the Townsend Acts and the Quartering Act, relationships between the colonists and Parliament became a little better for about two years or so. Well, things go south again, which is our next subtopic, another conflict between colonists and Great Britain, and this conflict occurred on June 9, 1772. So we talked about the Townsend Acts being repealed in 1770, the Quartering Act being repealed in 1770, and things were pretty good for about two years. However, on June 9th of 1772, things got a little crazy. And things got crazy in Narragansett Bay, which was off the coast of Rhode Island. Okay? So on June 9th, 1772, in Narragansett Bay, which is just off the coast of Rhode Island, another conflict is going to happen between colonists and British officials. Okay, on June 9, 1772, in Narragansett Bay, off the coast of Rhode Island, we're going to have another conflict between colonists and British.
Well, this is the arrogance of kind of one man, a British commander by the name of William Duddingston. William Duddingston. He's on your ID sheet. William Duddingston. Kind of a little bit of an arrogant fellow. He's a British commander, and he commands a British vessel called the Gas Bay. Okay, and it's spelled a little differently. So, British commander William Dunningston of the British vessel, vessel Gas Bay takes some action that's going to cause some conflict between colonists and the British. What do you think he's going to do in Narragansett Bay off the coast of Rhode Island concerning his British vessel Gas Bay to make a conflict occur? What do you think could possibly happen? Anybody have an idea? What would he be doing that might cause conflict? Think about what we talked about. What's still a concern? Smuggling. So what do you think Duddingston's doing there, Dalton? Absolutely. He made it his life's mission to stop all colonial ships coming from England to check their cargo for smuggling. Made it his life's mission. Okay, so he trying to catch these smugglers. He's stopping every colonial ship that comes into Narragansett Bay to check for smuggled items. Now, in his zeal to stop all colonial ships, he's not paying attention one evening on June 9, 1772, and he runs the gas bay aground off the coast of Rhode Island. He gets too close to shore and runs it aground, which means he, high, what's he do? Gets it high centered, so to speak, on rocks and can't move. Okay? So in his zeal to capture or, or stop these colonial ships and board them and check them for smuggled goods, he gets too close to the shore and he runs the gas bay aground. In other words, he high centers it on the rocks and it gets stuck there. Okay. Now, what's he got to wait for before his ship is going to be released from the coastline? The tides. And he said it's going to be nine hours before that tide comes in to, to wash him out of that area. So, the Gatsby would have to set nine hours before high tide would come in that would release his ship from the coastline. Well, that night, a very wealthy colonial merchant who didn't appreciate his ships being stopped and checked for smuggling, his name was John Brown, decided since Dunningson's actions were hurting his business, he was going to get a little payback. So as the gas bay and Dunnington are high-centered, so to speak, waiting for the high tide to come in, this very wealthy colonial merchant by the name of John Brown, who doesn't appreciate Duddington's actions, decides he's going to get a little payback. Okay? Now, he knows when high tide's going to come in, and it was probably estimated about 3 in the morning on June 10th. So Brown knows that this tide, he's around that area, he's a colonial merchant, has ships, he knows it's going to be about 3 in the morning the next day on June 10th before this high tide comes in to free this ship. So what do you think he's going to try to get his revenge right before that or before they get loose? So what he does is he sends 65 men and 8 whale boats on a raid of the gas bay. So before high tide comes in, and he's got it pretty much timed out, John Brown, this rich colonial merchant, sends 65 of his men and 8 of his whale boats, and he's going to raid the gas field. Now what do you mean when you raid it? What could you do if you raid a ship? Take everything off it. What else could you do if you raid a ship? What? Before that, capture the crew and then destroy the boat if you want to go crazy. Okay? Well, 
As the raiding boats reached the gas bay, a fellow by the name of Joseph Buckland, without any orders to do so, aims and fires at Commander Duddingston. Aims and fires at him. Doesn't get any orders to do it, just does it on his own. So receiving no order to do so, as the raiding boats reached the gas bay, Joseph Buckland aims and fires at Commander Duddingston. And he hits him. Well, during this raid, Brown and his men capture the crew of the gas bay. And Duddingston lives only because a colonial doctor treats him. A colonial doctor treats him. And Duddingston lives after being shot by Joseph Buckland. So John Brown and his men and his whale boats capture the crew of the gas bay. And only because a colonial doctor treats Duddingston does he survive this raid. Well, what does John Brown then order his men to do once he raids the ship and captures the crew? He orders them to what? Set fire to it. Very good. Set fire to it. Well, I think his intention was to, you know, basically burn it up. Unfortunately, when those flames reached the powder magazine, and that's an area in the ship in which they stored the gunpowder, as soon as that flame reached the powder uh, magazine on the ship, what does it do? Explodes and blows the ship up. Not good. I mean, burning it's one thing, blowing it up is another. Okay? So... Brown and his men capture the crew of the gas bay. Commander Duddingston has survives because of treatment he receives from a colonial doctor. John Brown then orders his men to torch the gas bay. And when the flames reach the powder magazine in the ship, the vessel blows up. Okay? Well, how do you think the British Parliament took this? Not good. Okay? Not good at all. And what do they want? What does the British Parliament want? What would you want if you were the British Parliament, Dave, um, after hearing about this? I want the commander back. You'd want the commander back. Okay, what else would you want? I want a new ship. <laughs> well, they did push for a new ship, but they did push for the capture and punishment of who? Oh, John Brown. And his men. Mm -hmm. So, upon hearing word of this incident, the British Parliament demand the capture and punishment of John Brown and his men. And as Dane said, they wanted their guy back. And they more than likely wanted their ship replaced. But their main focus was, I want John Brown, I want those 65 men, and I want them punished. Now let me ask you this question, because this becomes a little bit controversial. We'll talk about it more. So let's say they capture him, and they put him on trial. Where are they going to try him? Okay, colonial courts. Or where might they want him brought? Ryan Lochte. Anybody know that story? Huh? Yeah, take him back to Brazil because he screwed up in Brazil. Now, according to the English, since they screwed up in Narragansett Bay and Rhode Island, whose waters did they kind of screw up in? British waters because it was in the bay. So they want to take these guys back to England and try him there. I hate to. That would not be bad. It's just like Ryan Lochte, if you haven't heard that story, the guy that makes up the story that he was robbed by uh, police in Rio de Janeiro. It's such a long story. And he lied, and so now they're pissed at him because that made their country look bad. And so he's going to have to go back to Brazil to face charges. You don't want to get yourself in trouble in a foreign country and end up going back to the foreign country because they might sense you to who knows what. So who knows whether, if I was him, I wouldn't go. But I don't know what he'll do. But anyway, when caught, the British government made it very clear that the men should be brought back to England for trial. Well, fortunately for Brown and his men, they were never captured by British authorities. So they got off scot-free, so to speak. Never captured them. I bet they made a tremendous effort not to get caught, wouldn't you think? But they never did capture them. But what it did is it caused further conflict between the colonists 
and Great Britain when we had all, you know, two years of fairly decent relationships. Okay? Well, that will take us to maybe one of the most controversial acts that the British passed during this time of moving towards independence, and that was the Tea Act of 1773, which you probably have heard a little bit about. The Tea Act of 1773. Now this was kind of an arrogant tax in a way, because after they repealed the Townsend Acts, the British government were determined to have some sort of a tax to prove that we have the power to tax you. Okay? So they've had to eat crow twice, right? Stamp Act and Townsend Acts. So they don't want the colonists to think that every time they burden them with the tax that they can just do whatever they want and force the repeal of that tax. So after the repeal of the Townsend Acts, the British government was determined to have some sort of a tax to prove the point they had the power to tax the colonies. Okay? And even though this tax on tea was very small, what do you think the colonies did? Refused to pay it. Even though it was a small tax, it was the point. So again, after the repeal of the Townsend Acts, the British government was determined to having a tax to prove the point that they had the power to tax the colonies, and even though the tax on tea was pretty small, many colonists refused to pay it. Now what else might they do besides refuse, refuse to pay the tax on tea? Protest it by not doing what? By, well, not drink your clothes. They also protested by saying, we will not purchase any more tea from Great Britain. We will boycott the purchase of tea from Great Britain as well as refuse to pay the tax. Well, what happens if we're not buying British tea? What's happening back in Great Britain, those warehouses? Yeah, they're just getting fuller and fuller of tea, right? Because they got no one to, nowhere to send it, since America is where they sent most of their tea. So in time, large amounts of unsold tea were piling up in warehouses in Great Britain. And probably the most famous company that sold tea was the East India Company. East India Company. And that East India Company had a lot of clout with Parliament, and they were beginning to complain because of all the tea that was stacking up in their warehouses. Does that make sense? Now, why would Parliament listen to the East India Company anyway? Why would they even listen to them, to their complaint? What? They're big. What? What? Who's that? But who has control? Not the king, but the... Here's the thing. A lot of the members of parliament were what? Owners of the East India Company, which was what you were getting at. So, um, Many of the members of parliament own stock in the East India Company, so they're pretty quick to act when they're losing money, right? Well, parliament even had to lend the East India Company a large sum of money so they could continue their business. And the East India Company's got to find a way to circumvent the colonial merchants' protest by not buying any more tea, right? you got to find a way around that. I want you to think about this. What would you do if you were the East India Company to get by the fact that these colonial merchants were protesting by not buying any tea from you? What would you do? You thinkers now. Who, who else might be a little upset in the colonies 
that these colonial merchants weren't buying any more tea. People that drank tea, right? So if you're a colonist and you really like tea, all of a sudden you're not getting any tea because they're not buying any, the colonial merchants. How might the East India Company circumvent those merchants? Sell directly to the colonists because they're willing to buy. So how do you hurt the colonists by doing that? How do you hurt the colonists by selling directly to the colonists themselves? How do you do that? Think about it. Well, there'll be colonists maybe that way, JC, that say, well, you know, I don't want to be part of this circumvention. I hate to compare it to drugs, but some people would buy drugs under any circumstance. Some people like tea, okay? So how is that, how, how are the East India Company, how's that, going to, how's that going to really irritate the colonial merchants, other than the fact they're just selling them the tea and, and bypassing them? What's that? No? Opposite. Yeah, the East India Company is going to lower the price so that these colonists don't care that they're circumventing the merchants. Because how does this work? It works in this country today. You think that the people that sell groceries to Kent Folger at uh, Blair's Market, do you think they sell them to Kent for the same price he sells them for? Absolutely not. Okay, They sell them to Kent. Kent then sells them to you to make a profit. That's what he does. Okay? So, who's not making the profit if they're 